Okay, good afternoon. We're just a month away from the end of the semester, so it's time we talk about the oral presentations and the format, how you schedule your oral presentation. I've also made some adjustments to the calendar. I'll show you what they are. They impact mostly the last week of the semester. Then I will, as usual, explain what we're going to do during week 11, which is the current week, and I will spend most of the time today talking about the next reading, the next book we're going to discuss and analyze in class, which is Luigi Barzini's Packing to Paris, published at the end of 1907. The English edition we're using is from 1908. Let's look at the calendar first. So, this is the last week of the semester, week 15, starting with November 28th. Monday is the week after the Thanksgiving break. As you can see, I have replaced office hours and class time lectures with time for oral presentation. That is to say, we're now going to meet in class, in this classroom, for the last week of the semester, because I'll be spending time with you individually doing oral presentations. The Calendly links that you find throughout this week and the beginning of the next one on the calendar are different from those that were posted and are still present throughout the rest of the calendar. They're specific to the uh, oral presentations, and I'll show you in a moment, okay? So you find oral presentations in lieu of Zoom office hours on Monday the 28th, no class, no office hours on Tuesday, Wednesday the office hours are replaced by the oral presentations, etc. and this applies also to Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday is the last day to do a presentation on Zoom or the last day to submit a pre-recorded video presentations. Following that, I will still be having office hours on Zoom and on December 11th, Sunday, that'll be the deadline for your final project. I've adjusted that initially the deadline was December 9th, but I've extended it by two days as I usually do. Okay, so that is the time you have to complete your, present, your project, the final draft of your project inside your Google Docs file. And this time, contrary to what happens with the assignments, with the assignments, if you're a little bit late, uh, nothing happens. This time though, starting from December 12th, your file will be locked. You will be able to access the file for viewing, but you will not be able to do any work on your project unless you've requested an extension and that extension has been approved. Yes, question? Um, so if we're doing an oral presentation, say this year, if we're doing an alternative final, what would our oral presentation be about? Still about the novel, The Black Motor Car, and with the same format, show and tell. That is to say, you put on the screen key passages from the novel and you talk about the characters, the situations, the relevance that the car has in this novel. So you don't present your entire project, your entire paper, because that's the final draft's role. You just present the most interesting findings, showing that you're able to talk about those findings on your own without reading. You can have an outline in front of you, but you 
uh, explain the significance of a few passages you talk about the novel and what you found that would be relevant pertinent for the topics of this class okay and finally on December 13th we have the exam it is a Tuesday Tuesday morning that's the uh, way the schedule of the finals work of course the uh, time slot reserved to us is, is longer is from 11 15 to 1 45 p.m. but all we need is two hours and therefore we'll be here from 11 30 a.m. to 1 30 p.m. and this room will be the room for the final yes they will we go over will be on the exam I'm sorry? Will we go over will we be in the Yes, exactly. This week, either today or Thursday, it is part of the lesson plans of this week to talk about the exam. And of course, we can talk about it again between now and the end of the semester. And by the end of the semester, I will also circulate a short list. Although it won't be a short, short list, right? It will still include most of the readings and most of the films, but I usually offer a selection of readings and films on which the final exams questions will be based. Okay, so this now is the page for news and announcements, and I'll start with the oldest among those that were posted yesterday, and this is about the oral presentations. So, the recommended format for the oral presentation is for you to present in front of me on Zoom. It will be just each student and myself during that presentation. And the way you schedule that, the period as you can see in here, is between Monday, November 28th and Tuesday, December 6th, from 9 a.m. through 6 p.m. and when you click on this, this is what you find. You find highlighted and marked in blue all the days where you can pick a time. And whenever you go and click on any of these days, you will see all the times. The time slots are, of course, 20 minutes to allow enough time to uh, get ready, deliver your presentation, listen to my comments in fact we have a little bit of extra time because the app is programmed so that there will be a 10 minutes buffer between one presentation and another but that buffer is computed only after you schedule one of those times okay so once you've decided what time you can schedule of course Whenever I have a meeting, you don't see any times here between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. because I have something else in my agenda and whenever someone picks a time, that time will disappear from the list. But when you pick a time, then you're asked to confirm and you simply put in here your name, first and last, your email. If you want to add anything, you don't really have to use this box, but in case you have already prepared something, a presentation, or you want to add the link to your Google Docs file, you could use that. And you can add your uh, phone number here. It will not be accessible on my side, and you can schedule the event, and you will receive an email to confirm that. From that email, you can also, if you keep that email, you can also cancel and reschedule, okay? So I suggest you archive that email. Otherwise, you can go to back to the app, find a new time, and then tell me to delete the other time, okay? So no problems if you schedule a time and then you find later on that you have to reschedule I suggest that you schedule an appointment as soon as possible in any case and then reschedule later. Since most days have plenty of 
time slots. You can pick any time. Of course, if you pick a time that is in the earlier part of the segment reserved for presentations, this means that if you receive feedback from me based on the presentation on how you could improve your project, you have more time to work on it, right? And, and the closer you are to the deadline and the less time you may have to work on the project if necessary. That is also the advantage of presenting in front of me. There are two advantages in opting for the Zoom format. One is we're there, you're live. So if your presentation doesn't have the right focus, the right pace, I'll just tell you, right? If you're reading too much from your notes, I'll just tell you, let's talk about it. Or let me ask a few questions. And I've seen presentations that were a bit lame turn into good presentations because actually the students knew the matter. They were just too afraid that the presentation would not be formally perfect and therefore they were trying to read too much. But once I invited them not to do that and I engaged in a more interactive kind of exchange, the presentation went well. You don't have that kind of immediate feedback on the presentation itself if you pre-record a video. The other thing is that if you pre-record a video, you may not receive my feedback before the deadline. It all depends on how early, early you send in the video, right? And uh, the, the other uh, items on my agenda. If you send a pre-recorded video, the feedback will be posted by me inside the Google Docs file. Okay, so feedback, by feedback, I mean, of course, a grade for the presentation with some comments whenever needed and feedback about the project, such as you're on the right track, it seems like a strong project, or you may rethink the inclusion of this document, or you may expand the analysis of that document, etc. Okay, if you pre-record a video, of course, you should put it on the cloud and then share the link with me. And the best tool you can use is really Zoom. Because with Zoom, you can, with the app that you have access to through the university, you can do the kind of show and tell that I recommend as a format for the presentation. That is to say, you can put passages of the documents you have included in the project and highlight passages, explain, comment on what you're showing on the screen and you will be visible on a corner as well. So the presentation will be technically good enough and excellent from the point of view of the format. The worst tool for this would be a narrated PowerPoint. Every semester has some narrated PowerPoint. The 1990s called, they want the narrated PowerPoints back. Don't use them, they're flat, right? And again, you may think, oh, I'm so smart because I'll be reading, but no one can see me read. Well, I, I can feel that you're reading, right? And again, the purpose of the presentation, the goal, the learning goal of the presentation is for you to show me that you've become an expert at the material of your project. And therefore, you, could, you can talk about those topics. You can demonstrate, you can explain, you can unpack the contents just by using your brain. Again, nothing wrong if you have an outline, nothing wrong if you pause and, and look for the next thing to, to say, right? Or, or to gather yourself. Nothing's wrong with that, and if you pre-record the video, don't worry about edit, editing out the, the, the pauses unless they're a minute long, right? The presentation doesn't have to be perfect. It's not judged on the perfection of your delivery. What I want to see your, is, is the level of competency you've acquired on the topics 
of this class. And as far as the project, I'll have it to read myself. That's why I don't need you to read it to me. You talk to me about your project with a language that is adequate for an academic thing, right? It's not like, yo, dude, this is my project. Not exactly so, even when professors say you don't have to be formal, it is still an academic assignment. But your syntax doesn't have to be perfect. You can very well say, oh, wait a moment, I forgot to add one thing, let me go back and talk about this before I proceed. Because it's fine. Because live presentations have those minor imperfections that are part, part, part of life. They don't detract from the overall quality of the work you've done during the semester or the knowledge you've acquired. Okay, so keep that in mind whether you choose the Zoom presentation, which is a recommended format, or the recorded video. Keep those principles in mind, okay? And as far as the digital devices themselves, if all you have with a camera is a phone, that'll be fine as well, right? Make sure that the light is right, that you're not pre-recording in the dark at 1 a.m. with your roommate in the background. I've had that, thank you. Or you have a, a very bright light in, 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 in your back and, and you're in and out like a ghost, right? But other than minor adjustments which you can see and do on the screen, you don't need fancy digital devices to deliver a good presentation, okay? Of course, if you share the video link with me, I will download the video, check that the video is playing on my computer, and confirm that I have received your video, which means everything is working, or tell you something is wrong with the file you uploaded, please fix it, or I don't have access to the file, the server doesn't allow me to download it, and you're supposed to check your email, which you should do, your Stony Brook email, you should check anyway, right? Don't come back 15 days later saying, well, I, I didn't check my email, because you couldn't tell your boss a year from now if you graduate in May, right? Okay, so this about the presentation and I want to proceed unless there are questions. And again, we can talk more about it at the beginning of each class from now on. You just have to tell me, can we talk about the presentation? Can we talk more about the exam? Can we talk more about the final project? Again, since your presentation is between 10 and 15 minutes, you don't really need to have a completed project in order to give your presentation. Because really, if you were to present every single document, you would really have to be concise, concise and organized in order to present every document from the project. Whereas normally for 10, 15 minutes, you would present three of those documents and have enough time to go more in depth to present those documents, to analyze, to read a passage that is particularly interesting or significant or explain why you included a document. And then, based also on the presentation, you can, and, and the feedback you receive, you can proceed and complete your project following the template or you can uh, add the treatment of other documents or replace one of those documents after the conversation we had. If you hear that one of the documents is a bit weak and you still have time to do something about that, okay? So as long as you keep working on your project through the month of November, by the end of the month, you should have enough to present I've showed you this from the calendar, so those classes will not happen 
and I'll be spending time with you on Zoom or watching your pre-recorded video. I had this format in mind, but I didn't act on the syllabus, the list of topics, the calendar, because uh, this list of contents was based on uh, another class where I needed the last week to finish the program, and now we're in good shape. I can get to the end of the readings by um, the final, before the final week of the semester, and therefore we can make the final week presentations as other classes do. Okay, so I've noticed a couple of times I received the attendance sheet. I, I, I had a head count, but the signatures were more than the people in the room. Do you really want to risk the consequences of getting reported? Because it is a violation of the Academic Integrity Code and uh, a, a report will be the consequence. So whoever you are, stop it, don't do it, don't take this chance. And I know that in regards to academic violations, you find at Stony Brook professors who don't do anything, professors who report every single violations. I've been a member of the academic judiciary for many years, so you know where I stand on that. This is the last part of the lectures and readings. I've made a few changes. I've brought Luigi Barzini to week 11, it was previously on week 12, but we're ready for that. And we'll continue through week 12 with a selection of passages analyzed. This week's film will be more scenes from Traffic, and the next week's movie will be Le Mans, still from 1971, Steve McQueen's Le Mans. Week 13 and 14 will analyze the motor maids across the continent, which is a young adult fiction novel from 1911. Very interesting. Yes, Johnny. Yeah, before we proceed, I had a question regarding the project. Is it okay if we use uh, one primary document, but two yes. weeks to work on the other one? Yes. We have different passages from that. It's up to you. Okay. So a single PDF may have enough relevant documents for you. So if you're satisfied what you, with what you find in, in that source, there is no magic number. It's about the quality and how relevant are your findings. They can come from a variety of magazines or just one, from a variety of issues, or from just one collection yeah, of issues. Yeah, we found different, very relevant stories from the automob automobile magazine, which was one single primary document. That's okay, right? make sure that your documents are all culturally relevant, right? Because especially specialized magazines will offer hundreds of articles on the automobile, but some of them are just factual, have no interesting references to society, social practices, to the representation of the car, to the experience of the car and how it was perceived or the car as a product, but otherwise, yes. Uh, you may have just one source. Okay, so we have the motor mates across the continent at week 13 and 14 together with two films after Le Mans, which is a film about car racing. We'll go back and watch scenes from Speedway, a car racing film from 1929. And then the last film will also be about car racing. It's called The Crowd Roars from 1932. And again, week 15, as you can see, will be devoted just to oral presentations and no particular assignments there since you have your project, your presentation, etc. This is week 11, the page for week 11, and this is the section we'll be using today about Luigi Barzini's book, 
on the race from Beijing to Paris. This is a monument to the car that won that race that you find in a city in Russia where uh, there used to be, or maybe still is, a Pirelli factory making tires. And you find here a number of links, but mostly you'll see through my presentations, which are the most relevant, and others are there for your curiosity. I've also included some links in Italian. Don't worry about them. If you know Italian, you can open them. And some of them have pictures that you can look at, okay? But these links are not required readings. I've also added a few YouTube videos. Some of them are in Italian with translation, with captions in English. Others you can just watch, it doesn't matter. At least you have images. This is from 2007. The same car that was driven from Beijing, China to Paris, France in 1907, 100 years later, perfectly restored, did the same trip uh, the other way around, from Paris to Beijing, and it was filmed. Uh, the vehicles, the orange vehicles you see, have the uh, TV crews, and uh, this turned into a TV series on Italian TV, and you can find plenty of clips on YouTube from that. So that is absolutely the same car, still working, still able to travel between nine and 10,000 miles 100 years later. This is the section about the final exam. I'll be talking about it probably on Thursday. If by any chance there is time today, I will introduce this today. Otherwise, on Thursday, we will talk about the final exam. You can read already these bullet points and then I will expand on them. As I said, the movie will be traffic, we'll watch the conclusion, and the, the, the assignments are just readings, right, uh, about the second set of excerpts from Luigi Barzini. You have one last written assignment, which is posted on week 10, and it's due by week, by November 9. Okay, so this is a PDF and you can open it, look at it on the browser or download it from the page on week 11. It starts with a quote from Barzini's book that mentions the vertiginous delights of speed, which is one of the central ideas to the whole book that Barzini, after traveling on the car that won this endurance race from 1907, wrote and published not only in Italian, but in 11 different languages. By 1908, the book was a global bestseller. It's a good phrase to encapsulate the core idea of the book because it brings us back to two ideas. One, that speed is the new dimension of modern life. In society, in general, everything has to be, to be happening faster and with reference to technology. And also the idea that one of the effects one of the immediate effects of speed, of technologies that bring the sensation of speed on their users is similar to an intoxication, right? Vertigo gives you this idea that your mind cannot control the effects of experiencing speed. Keep in mind that we're not talking really about vertiginous speeds the Itala car that was custom made for 
the owner, Prince Scipione Borghese, in 1907 by this touring-based company called Itala that was created by one of the pioneers of the Italian automotive industry, Maurizio Ceirano, who created several companies and, and then sold his shares of the company and moved on to another enterprise or the company itself closed. The Itala car was able to reach a top speed of around 60 miles per hour. But in the configuration that was used for the endurance race that took the car from Beijing to Paris, that is to say with the addition of two more gas tanks. The basic gas tank only has 50, holds 50 liters of gasoline, which is 12, 13 uh, gallons. They added two more gas tanks, 150 liters each, for a total of 750 uh, liters, that would be 200 gallons, approximately. Plus they had 50 liters of water, both for the people, the crew of the car, and also for the uh, cooling system of the car. They added an extra oil tank with 50 liters of lubricating oil. Then they had a tent, they had supplies for themselves, they had clothes, they had spare parts because they were traveling through China, Mongolia, Siberia, Eastern Russia, all places where you wouldn't be able to find spare parts. In fact, the major breakdown suffered by the car, the only one surprisingly that was a major breakdown, was the breaking of a wheel. Wheels were done with wood and, and they had rubber tires. So one of the wheels broke because of the poor quality of the roads by the time they entered Russia, the uh, uh, wheel broke and they went to a carpenter, to a local carpenter, and they told him, can you make one of these? And the guy took a disc of wood, an ax, and proceeded to carve out a wheel that was good enough to take them from Eastern Russia to Paris, okay? So with everything on board, including the crew of three, the owner, Prince Scipione Borghese, the mechanician and co-driver, Ettore Guizzardi, and the journalist, Luigi Barzini, who ended up writing the book, we end up with between 4,000 and 5,000 pounds of weight. And therefore, the previously quoted speed of 95 kilometers or 60 miles would go down to about 45, maybe 50 miles fully loaded, depending also on the conditions of the car. Of course, as I've said multiple times, if you are on that kind of car, which is pretty high, the, the tires were pretty big, the wheels and the tires were pretty big, the sensation of speed even if you're traveling 50 miles, it feels like you're doing 200 in terms of, of the, feel, the strength of the feelings and, and how scary that would be. Imagine, of course, not having a seat belt or even not having a seat because by the end of the trip, the journalist was, well, not even the end of the trip, but by the time they exited China, the rear seat, there was a single rear seat in the back, was occupied by supplies and the journalist would often uh, uh, sit on the side of the car with his legs on the steps, on the side steps of the car. So uh, pretty dangerous uh, as, as well. So we're talking about the physical impact, what it means to be driving a car for your body, for your nervous system, for your psyche. And clearly, as it happens with many books from the period about traveling on a car, touring on a car, the assumption is that the whole interaction with the landscape, 
also changes, that this is a new experience also in terms of this aspect of life. There is the strong suggestion that the new technology involves a degree of symbiosis between the users and the car itself. And one of the characters in the book, because this is, is a book about a factual experience, but the people turn into characters, the mechanician Hector Guizzardi turns into the representat representative of a new kind of human individual who has this kind of symbiotic relationship with the car. Someone who can feel from the vibrations, from the noise, from the smell, if the car is doing well, and someone who spends a lot of time with the car. We will see in the selection of passages that I will offer later on from the book, how, for example, in one scene, Ettore is represented as found often during the trip, found under the car. Not necessarily working on the undercarriage of the car, just spending time with it. Just looking at it, just staying in the proximity of the car because they form a one unit, a, a new symbiotic creature that is part car, part human. The most innovative idea in the book, though, is this idea that the future of humanity will take place in a landscape, whether it natural, rural, urban, that will be inhabited heavily by these new technologies. The car, the planes, etc., the telegraph, the phone. And therefore, the survival of humans depends on their ability to adapt to this new environment. The new environment with technology will become the standard for the evolution of the next century. That is the assumption. That is to say that according to the racial or the ethnic view of the world by the journalist Luigi Barzini, who was very much a, t a man of his time, and it's not surprising that later on he supported fascism <coughs> and, and that, of course, had a negative effect on the last part of his life. He died right after the war in 1947. He was destitute. He had problems with the Italian law because he was classified as a collabor collaborationist, an active supporter of fascism. But according to the journalist, the future of each ethnic group or race in the world depends on their ability to adapt to this new landscape inhabited by the technology. It doesn't mean anything whether the technology is already there. They will travel through large parts of Asia where no automobiles could be found in 1907. It doesn't matter. However, whenever they encounter, they stop, of course, along the way, right? They, they took two months from June 10th to August 10th, 1907, to go from Beijing to Paris. So they stop, and every place they stop, people gather around the car. People are curious, or even when they see them pass by. So the way the journalist approaches the description of the exchanges with the people is such that he is trying to evaluate even from the initial reactions to the view of the new technology, whether these people, people living in Siberia, in Mongolia, in China, will be able to show signs of an inclination, of a propensity to evolve and adapt to a world that will be heavily technological. Okay? Keep that in mind. These theories derived heavily from the scientific theories introduced by Charles Darwin apply to society. So clearly you don't have a biologist here. You don't even have a scientist. Barzini was a high school dropout. He went to an accounting school 
which still exists in Italy. You can go to a specialized high school called Ragioneria, and when you get your diploma, you can get your license to become a CPA, an accountant, which is the first level. Then if you go to a business school, you are a commercialista, which is a professional, not just an accountant, but a professional who can deal with a more important accounts. So he went to high school, didn't finish high school, uh, and uh, right around the age he came out, drop, dropped out of high school, he lost both of his parents and, and started working as a journalist. And went on to have a, an incredible career, became a world famous journalist, even through feats, adventures such as this, but he was a self-taught man. Right? Uh, even when he talks about the prince, the owner of the car, is in awe because the prince was a highly educated man, right? As an aristocrat, the prince could afford a first degree education. He spoke several languages, including Russian and French. And so Barzini uh, felt, felt the, the admiration for, for this, this man. So, these are not biological ideas. These are crude adaptations of Darwin, Darwin's idea to society. So this idea of the survival of the fittest applied to races and to society means the races who will adapt to circumstances of an environment dominated by technology will be able to survive. This is true of different nations and different races. This is true within each ethnic group of different groups, different social classes. So the idea was in reference to social classes that for the most part, if you are in a position in life, it depends on your natural qualities. There is a Darwinian justice to your placement in society. If you have skills and talents given by nature and developed by you and you're able to adapt to your environment, you can move up in society. And that would be the case of Ettore, allegedly, according to the theories expounded in this book. Even though Ettore Wizzardi died in the 1960s, he was the one of the three who lived the longest and as, as a low income man. Right, he, he would fix cars, drive people around. Once in a while, people would go and find him where he lived in the small house where he lived to interview him or to hear, just curious to hear his stories of, of what happened in, the, in this endurance uh, race. But according to these theories, if you are in a place in society and you're not moving up then it means that as a Darwinian creature, you don't have the skills to do so, right? Now, I said before, these are not ideas of scientists, but in, in fairness, it must be said that even scientists, social scientists especially, try to apply, apply Darwin's idea to society. And the best example, and certainly the example that was best known in Italy to someone like Barzini, was the example of Cesare Lombroso, one of the founders of criminology, world-renowned criminologist and anthropologist who believed that within each social group you can find subspecies of the human species. He went to the... Uh, jails in Italy, male and female prisons, to study the bodies and the minds of the criminals who were there, who had been convicted, because he thought that most people there ended up there because nature predisposed them to that conclusion. He studied prostitutes thinking that most of these women must have become prostitutes because they were naturally predisposed to that role in society. And he wanted, through exact measurements of their bodies, of their skeletons, and tests of their psyche, he wanted to find the formula 
the algorithm that would allow him to predict early on in life whether an individual could become a criminal, a violent criminal, or a prostitute. That's how he saw uh, the, the male and female gender. Uh, and, uh, and, and avoid that, prevent that, right? Or, or uh, uh, find a, a sort of cure, right? These ideas are expanded by someone like Barzini in a different direction. That is to say, technology is coming, technology will dominate society and where, where you live. Are you predisposed to interacting with technology? And certainly this uh, extends not from, from the automobile to other technologies that were being introduced in society during that time. So let's talk about the characters that we have uh, already named and say a little more about them in life and about them in the book because as I said the book makes them into symbolic characters right the book wants to be a gospel of the new technological world so this is the prince Scipione Borghese he was a real prince if you click on the biographical articles you find that he had five or six names right like aristocrats used to have his family went back to dated back to the middle ages they even had a pope among their ancestors it was an aristocratic family located in rome and central italy and like many other aristocratic families they have plenty of villas and palaces in different locales he was born in 1871 he was the oldest of the three men traveling on the Itala car from Beijing to Paris, from China to France. As I said, came from a very wealthy, not just aristocratic, but also a wealthy and powerful family, well connected in Italian society. So he received a good education and then in his 20s devoted his life to traveling through Asia, he had already been through Asia even before he acquired a car. After he acquired a car in the 1900s, accompanied by Ettore, by that time they were uh, traveling together, they went all over Italy, they explored parts of Europe, they went back to uh, the Middle East with the car. So he had enough experience to be winning the race. And I added a link to the second driver, the driver of the second car. He got to Paris in two months, traveled about 10,000 miles because he deviated from the uh, straightest itinerary from Beijing to Paris. Uh, the second classified car got there 20 days later, at the end of August. And the third and fourth car got to Paris so late that by that time nobody was interested in them and we don't have articles in the press documenting when they arrived. A fifth car, only five car participated in the race, was retired because of technical difficulties. It was not even a car by modern standards, it was a tricycle because they believed that a lighter vehicle could fare better on the roads of China and that wasn't the case. The sturdiest and heaviest vehicle, the one driven by the prince, uh, won in fact. Uh, the prince didn't live long. He died in 1927. So he was not really heavily involved with fascism. Fascism took power in 1922 in Italy. His family did. Members of his family went on to fight during Second World War with fascism until the very end, to, to the bitter end, but not him. The picture that Barzini included, and most of these pictures were taken by Barzini himself, who traveled with a camera, wants to give you an idea of the symbolic role assigned to the prince. He, you see him reading, elegantly dressed, and the prince really 
is supposed to be the perfect embodiment of a Renaissance man who is intellectually developed as much as he is physically developed and also morally developed. Someone who is smart, who is determined, driven, and someone who's courageous. So that would be an example, according to the book, the perfect example of a leader according to the notion, which is Darwinian, although, as we said before, a, a rather crude adaptation of Darwin's theory of natural aristocracy. This idea that among the aristocrats, among those in general found in the elite, you will find people who deserve to be there, who got there because they have certain skills, certain qualities that you would recognize in them, even if you didn't know that they were a prince, right? And, and remember how this concept worked in the lightning conductor, right? Molly Randolph believes that Jack, James Brown, is just a driver. She doesn't know he is an aristocrat, a British aristocrat, wealthy and powerful. However, she natu she's naturally drawn to him and she finds in him the qualities of a leader, right? So that would be a good example for the understanding of the notion of natural aristocracy, okay? We don't know how much uh, time the prince spent really driving the car. It's, it's more than possible we know that Ettore, the mechanician, drove a lot. Maybe Ettore drove most of the time. I wouldn't be surprised. But of course, the, the prince was heavily involved in the whole operation. Whenever they had trouble, mechanical issues in uh, Siberia or Russia, the prince, uh, uh, relying on his knowledge of Russian, could call on the peasants, promise them money if they helped, uh, uh, if they help the car uh, and, and take the car out of a ditch or help them move the car when it sank in the mud. And at some point they went across a bridge, the brick broke down, the car uh, uh, remained stuck inside the bridge. The journalist fell into the river, hit his head on the rocks, uh, of the brook uh, below and, and suffered a serious head trauma. Later on, by the time they were in Russia, it was clear that they had so many days, there were so many days ahead of the second car that they decided, for example, to go to St. Petersburg because he had friends there, Russian aristocrats, European aristocrats of the highest level often knew each other. And uh, there, were, there were parties and celebrations um, through the rest of the trip until they reached Paris. This is Ettore Guizzardi. Ettore was the youngest of the three. He was born 10 years after the prince in 1881. His father was a train engineer. And as a teenager, Ettore traveled with his father on the locomotive engine. In 1898, I think, towards the end of the century, the late 1980s, 1890s, the train on which Ettore and his father were traveling derailed and his father died. He was wounded. Uh, the place where the train derailed was near one of the villas of Prince Borghese in Albano, outside of Rome, in the hills outside of Rome. So it was natural that they would bring the wounded, the injured from the train wreck to the villa. You may have seen similar scenes in Downton Abbey, for example. So that's how the prince met Ettore who was a teenager from his father, spending time on trains, he had already acquired some engineering skills, right? He was not formally educated. And the prince 
uh, uh, recognize him as a prodigy of, of the engineering kind and became his mentor and almost a father-like figure. So the prince sent him to Fiat to learn more about automobiles from the workers in the Fiat factories in Turin. Later, he was sent to the Italian army, but to a mechanized unit to learn more. And then, as I said, before 1907, they had already traveled extensively with the car. From the symbolic point of view, what is the role of this man in the book written by Barzini? He's the new man. The new man who has a natural predisposition, a natural understanding of the new technology. Somebody who was born and therefore is the perfect example of the future humans, the humans who will be in successful positions thanks to their spontaneous understanding of technologies. So throughout the book, Ettore is always represented in connection with the car, with a strong connection. He feels when the car uh, has some issues, he's the one who fixes the car. Part of the time he is driving the car <coughs> as well. Of course, Socially, he's in a subordinate position, right? The prince is also his master, right? His boss. And ideologically, the understanding is that this is a conservative view of society, right? Even if you're skilled, you are rewarded, your merits are rewarded with mobility, social mobility, but you're not supposed to subvert the order, right? The prince will remain the prince. Only Ettore will enjoy or is supposed to enjoy a better uh, social standing, which in fact didn't happen. And we know how the prince died almost 30 years before he did. So he went on to live by himself and, and not, was not uh, very successful. In, in some ways, the train wreck where his father dies and he begins his new life as the protege of the prince is like the second birth, right? He is born to a new life where technology acquires a more substantial place. And this is Luigi Barzini. Uh, he was only three years older, three years younger than the prince, but he looked much younger. As I said before, high school dropout from a low to middle income family, started working in the 1890s in journalism, simply publishing articles and vignettes. He could also draw. And vignettes and comic strips were very popular in the press at that time. So often, together with articles, he would send vignettes and drawings to be published. And he had a nice career. Uh, First, of course, working for secondary uh, publications, but then by the 1900s, he was working for the most important newspaper in Italy to this day, one of the two most important newspapers, the Corriere della Sera. When the Corriere della Sera was managed by a very young director, unusual choice for the time, Luigi Albertini, this young director called Barzini, to become a new kind of journalist. The director sent him to London for a year. He learned the language, so he could spoke, speak English well enough. And also, he was exposed to modern journalism. Of course, the British journalism was much different from the Italian journalism. Italian journalism was very literary, very stuffed, very antiquated, old-fashioned. and. British and American journalism, to which he was exposed through his travels and different jobs abroad, were more heavily based on facts, right? On the chronicle, not the fictional rendition, the fictional narrative of a fact. Before 1907, 
Barzini was already well known and extensively traveled. He had been not only to France and England, but also to the United States, to Canada, to Japan, to China, to Russia. So he seemed to be the man for the job when the director of the newspaper El Corriere della Sera learned about the race, the endurance race, he called him, as you find at the beginning of the book, and told him, not only you are going to cover this, and the Corriere della Sera paid 6,000 liras to have him on board the automobile, the winning automobile. 6,000 liras was enough for a small apartment at that time. But before he traveled with the Itala car from China to France, based on the instructions he received, he went to the United States, he followed a famous trial in New York City, he went to San Francisco, which had just suffered a tremendous earthquake. From there, he traveled to Japan and then to China. And then he drove, well, he, he was a passenger on board the Itala the rest of the trip. As I said, he had a camera. He took the pictures included in the book. When he came back in August, he started working on the book which came out a few months later because they, it had to be a media event. During the trip itself, he would send articles via telegraph from China, from Siberia, because there were telegraph stations and in fact the itinerary of the race was always close to a telegraph station because the idea was to make this a media event. And not only his articles were published by the Corriere della Sera in Italy, but also by the Daily Telegraph in England. He had a contract with them also. What does he represent symbolically in the book? What kind of characters does he become in the book? He is the new journalist. The journalist who is a practical, pragmatic intellectual who can not only document what is going on abroad, but can also identify and serve, package the technical information about technology, the economy, politics, the military that would help people in a position of leadership, people in the government, plan the best course of action for their societies. So he conceived of journalism as a branch of the executive power. The journalist finds the relevant information. And in his mind, information about mobility, for example, can we use vehicles to send goods from Europe to China and vice versa? Can we use vehicles to move soldiers through Siberia? or through China. This kind of information, he thought, would be highly relevant to anyone who needed to take care of the economy, provide a plan, a program, lines of development and growth for the economy, for the nationalist, nationalist politics of the time, and for any kind of military intervention. This is the French newspaper Le Matin, which sponsored the event. The event happened because, as you see here, on January 31st, 1907, they published this article on the first page, suggesting that a race, an endurance race, take place going from Paris to Pekin, to Beijing, by automobile. And they call it a prodigious challenge. The idea, as I said, was to have the vehicles travel alongside the telegraph lines so that they could send articles, reports, and therefore this was a way to sell more copies, right? Hear the news, learn the latest about the race. Keep in mind that this was a great period for newspapers. Newspapers sometimes were published several times during the day, or some newspapers 
just during the night or just during the earliest part of the morning. Notice what relevance they assign to the telegraph. They have telegraph poles and telegraph lines on both sides of the first page next to Le Matin and under the title of the newspaper, The Morning, right? This is a morning newspaper. They have the latest telegrams of the night, meaning we publish the freshest news as we got them from every corner of the world. Uh, we offer them to you. Keep in mind, this is a newspaper from this period. Uh, it's something with four pages, eight at the most, right? It's not the New York Times with a Sunday edition with 80 pages. But the idea is that we are selling what people are interested in. People are interested in technology. We create an event that they will be able to follow. From Paris to Paris to Beijing, then they realize that if the arrival, the culmination of this event takes place in Beijing, who's going to follow? And you're selling copies of newspapers, but the second thing you want to sell is merch, merchandise. So they change the itinerary from Beijing to Paris so that when they arrive in Paris, they can have hundreds of thousands of people and they can sell that day's newspaper about the race, postcards, photos, and other kinds of merchandise to the people, which in fact did happen. Unfortunately, once they reverted the uh, itinerary, initially they had something like 45 people who said, wrote to the newspaper saying, we uh, want to participate by the time they said we're leaving from China, at that point you need enough money to ship a, an automobile and spare parts to China. And most people withdrew. So by March, this was January, by mid-March, there were only few participants left in the race and they were about to give up on this event, on this initiative. However, what made them change their minds was a telegram from Prince Borghese who wrote to them saying, I'm in, and whether you do this race or not, I'll be going to Beijing and I'll be driving to Paris. Since Borghese was famous enough, they decided to have the race, even though by the end they only had five cars. This is from June 11th, and as you can see, Party, they, they've just left, they, they've departed, right? And you have five automobiles that have left yesterday Beijing and they're rolling across the Chinese steps. And these are the five participants, right? This is Prince Borghese. And as you can see, he was only 35, but he looked older. Uh, and this was the second classified Godard, and I've added an article in English about him. He, he was a scoundrel. He uh, uh, promised uh, that he would drive this car. He went to this Belgian company, Dutch company, Spiker, got a car from them and spare parts. And then when he learned that he would have to ship the car to China and he didn't have enough money, he sold all the spare parts, including the spare tires, including the fuel, uh, to pay for his trip to Beijing. Then in Beijing, he, he needed more money to buy fuel at the very least. He went to the Dutch consul and borrowed money from him and later was tried and convicted of stealing that money because he promised that the Spiker company would give back that money. Again, he was three weeks late. Um, and this is the tricycle that never got there. And these are the two cars that got in fourth and fifth position. This is the itinerary as it is presented. Notice that technology progress goes in a straight line, right? It looks like an almost straight line, but it wasn't. There were many more north to south deviations. So you have Beijing here, Manchuria, you have 
uh, Mongolia, in, in here you have Siberia, Russia, and then uh, this would be Central Europe and Paris. And this shows you a better view of the itinerary with the idea that it's not exactly a straight line. We don't know exactly how many miles they covered, between nine and 10,000 miles. The winning strategy for the Prince was not only to have the additional gas tanks on the car, which gave him uh, about a, a, an autonomy of approximately 1,000 kilometers, so that would be 600 miles. But he also shipped gasoline, oil, and spare parts across this itinerary. So they knew they would travel to a town, and in that town, somebody would have received gasoline for them, oil for lubrication, spare tires, and uh, some spare parts as well. Here you have more of the style of the event, right? You have the dispatches of the night, the telegrams of the night, and you have the report of what happened there. Uh, in uh, this is the day before they left, June 9th, and they mentioned Barzini as the journalist who sent in information about what is going on. And this is one of the many telegraph stations along the itinerary where they would stop and Barzini would send out articles that could be a few hundreds or a few thousand words long. So an entire article would be uh, changed into Morse code and sent out. Why would you find telegraph stations in the middle of Asia or Mongolia, as in this case? Simply because the signal of the telegraph had to be relayed. The signal became weaker, could not travel more than a few hundred miles. So if you want to send a telegram, Every few hundred miles, you have to have a station that receives the message and then sends it to the next station. So the existence of these offices and the mission of their clerks was simply to relay messages. And when Barzini opened the book in this place, the customer log for this office, his name was the name of the first customer. The office was working, but simply because people were sending telegrams from Beijing to Europe. But no one locally would use this kind of telegraph office, right? And everywhere they took pictures because this book is about technology, but it's about the races, it's about humans and their future. And everywhere is not just pictures of people from various regions and various ethnic groups, but people looking at you, looking at Barzini, looking at the car, right? So it's really like an anthropological study of the people they encountered. And this is the car. You can see how big the wheels are. Of course, Ettore was not a very tall man, but it was something like 5'4". So you can see the dimension of the car. Uh, you can appreciate how the car was custom made for the race. However, this is the car without the gas tanks and the additional water and oil tanks. They don't even have the seats. He's sitting on a wooden crate because initially when they left Beijing, they wanted to be as light as possible. And I'll show you why they wanted to be so light the next time. But the car was built like a truck. And that's why 100 years later, the car could travel again from Paris to Beijing after proper restoration. 